Ladies and gentlemen, we hope you enjoyed this afternoon's side events and parallel sessions. We will now have the third and final plenary session of the day, which is on global governance and the future of politics. The moderator for the session is Sonia Halfin, Director of Socio Publico. Please welcome her to the stage. We'll start, hello everyone and thank you for being here. We'll start actually with Julia. Julia Pomares, please. Thank you. Um, this is the first time the T20 addresses issues on global governance and the future of politics. And I'm very glad that our Japanese colleagues uh, who are going to take the lead next year and who are sitting here in this auditorium has decided that they're going to continue working on this path and keep working on these issues. Um, here also there are our co-chairs of the task force, uh, Felix Peña, Mark Flaubert, Helmut and Heyer. Uh, Dennis Nower couldn't come, but he also worked very hard. We had a very productive year. Uh, we produced, I think, more than 14 policy briefs and this paper that I'm going to present. So, we already heard many times today, we are living in an era of unprecedented changes. All the things that we have already listened today, climate change, technology changes, uh, many things that are going on today that is disruptive. So, we are obsessed with a question. Why, if everything is dramatically changing, why are we assuming that global governance will remain the same? And that is the question that decided that it was a very important moment for starting this conversation. And because the question is so, so, so puzzling, uh, we decided to take the lead of the work of PwC on the future of work. And we devised scenarios following the same strategy uh, for the future of politics. The report was written with Belen Abdala and with the support of Lacroix and Soubier. Uh, it was heavily from an intensive design workshop that we held in Berlin in May. Several of you who are here were participants there. Thank you very much. As the usual disclaimer, if you are not convinced by these scenarios, we are to blame and not them. So let's get into it. It's true, we are surrounded by increasing uncertainty, but there are some trends that we know are there and we are taking them for granted. And there are three. Technology, shifts in global economic power, and demography. Let me give you one indicator of each, so you believe me. Digital revolution and technology, it took us 10,000 years to go from hunting and recollection to agriculture, but the next phase of Industrial revolution will take place in 15 years. So we know that AI is ra radically transforming our economies. The second trend, the shifts in global economic power, the so-called E7, the emerging economies, are probably going to grow as twice, around twice as fast as G7 economies in, by 2050. So we already know that the economic power is shifting to the east. And then the last one, the changes in demographic changes, uh, the changes in demographic tendencies. We know that by 2050, with the exception of Africa, in every other country and region in the world, we're going to have more than a quarter of the population aged 60 or over. So these changes, we know that we need to take them for granted. They're going to be there. And how will these changes affect politics? And that was our uh, question. We first looked at the domestic arena, and I will not get into detail uh, on this part. You will have copies of our report uh, in the out outside of the room, if you want to take one. But we took a more conventional uh, uh, way here. These are the two variables that are very classical in political science, inclusion, uh, exclusion, social, and, uh, social inclusion and social exclusion on the horizontal axis and condensed power versus dispersed power on the vertical axis. We know that 
The cohesive and powerful world is where we would like all probably to live, is the established democracies. But we also know that we are moving and we are shifting to hybrid regimes. Many hands for little K, that's the name we uh, call this world of dispersed power in exclusive societies, something that we know a lot in Latin America, and also one for all, concentration of power in inclusive society. So these changes are taking place and we don't know where we are heading. And let me now get you to what is the main part of my presentation, is telling you what we are thinking about where global governance will go, or where are, what are the scenarios for, for this. We took two dimensions, and this is probably discretionary, you can say that are not the best one, but we think that are very important to understand uh, for the future of global governance. The one on the vertical axis, uh, whether we're going to be living in a world of many, many, many small firms where each of us could be an entrepreneur and a network of internet firms will be uh, dispersed around the world, or uh, on top, big firms. So this is what many of us are Concern today whether tech giants are going to be the main global economic powers in the next years. And then on the other axis, on the horizontal one, we have governance structures. Are we going to be uh, living in a world where all decisions are taken locally, where big cities are the main players, uh, as we are seeing, for example, today with climate change issues, are locally taking decisions in the 10, 15 years, or on the other side, we are going to global governance structures and globally, decision, uh, globally taken decisions. So these are our two dimensions. So then we get these four words. Um, let me start by the one uh, upper uh, left. Um, sorry, upper, uh, yeah, upper left, <laughs> it's, it's here, sorry. Uh, big foot in a... Um, in a local world, that is what we call it. This is a world driven by large and few companies where global governance structures lose leverage. This is a world that many are foreseeing these days. It is a world of inequality. Uh, local leaders here in 10 years, we have very hard time at negotiating with centralized, strong private enterprises. Global issues here, such as climate change, are hard to tackle. And this is an unstable scenario. We, we try to uh, visualize them. This is done by Socio Publico. We are trying to visualize how these words will look like. And here, what you also see is that cross-boundary regulations on technological developments are unlikely to, play, play, to take place. We think that political leaders are going to have a very hard time if we live in this world in some years' time. And then, if we move to the other upper corner, it's what we call the big friendly giant. You probably remember that, uh, that movie. This is a more stable environment in which the public and the private sectors get together and have to take decisions together. Maybe innovation might thrive here because these powerful global players can get on the table and decide where innovation should go. Here, maybe, and this is, they are all assumptions, they are all hypotheses. Here, we might think that aging population could be solved by some kind of global universal income, as some colleagues are demanding as a way of uh, solving these problems. But, and I think this is, a very important part of this world, we need very highly efficient politicians that can carry out a double game. They need to be taking those agreements, but also with the private firms, but also they need to take and decide regulatory frameworks globally. So we need also very efficient politicians here, and I don't know, and this is also a question for you, are we producing these politicians who can get into these global tables and, and have these decisions. You have it also here with all our... Yeah. 
And then we move to what we call the small under the global rule. And here, as you can see, we move to a world of local firms that are governed by global structures. They enable here interconnected networks of small firms, and government here have the capacity to solve very big problems and also to provide global public goods. It might be that this is a nice world to live. We also think that here there are costs of coordination. And finally, what we call small is beautiful, although we don't know if it is really beautiful. And it is where we have small firms but I have to take decision at the local level because there is no global structure to take these decisions together. And here, we think that there will be slower technological innovation, and more important, we think that here, one of the main challenges of today, how we regulate data property, is going to be very difficult to tackle. So this is a quite complicated word in many ways. So, if you think, what is the role of the G20 in each of these walls? I'm trying to get to the four walls, sorry. Here we are. If you think, what is the role of the G20 in each of these uh, scenarios? And let me ask you another question. Can we say that the G20 is going to survive in all of these scenarios? what the G20 should do in order to anticipate all these trends. That is what we started to discuss in, with this task force during this year. We think it's the start of a conversation and hopefully it can be revised and updated with all your comments and uh, comments today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julia. Please join us here. And ladies and gentlemen, please fasten your seat belts and locate the nearest exit doors because we are about to fly into the future of politics. We are indeed already flying at a speed of 60 seconds per minute. One, two, three, and where we are getting there. Uh, and I think it's indeed quite appropriate that we are using the word scenario because a scenario is something that by definition is in permanent flux. Uh, it's not like a scenario in Spanish, which is the floor, the stage, the floor where the actors are standing. The scenario is actually the movement of the actors, the changes in the scenery, the plot itself. So uh, that's why what Julia has just done with these different worlds and what we are all about to do today in this panel is so complicated. Because when we look at politics as a scenario, it might look like this. Let me show you. And not, not like, a bit in, like in a chaos, isn't it? Uh, but fortunately, we have today some very expert guides to help us here to try to understand these scenarios, these moving scenarios. Let me introduce them to you. There's Blair Shepard, a global leader strategy and leadership at PwC. He's also Professor Emeritus and Dean Emeritus of Duke University's Fuqua School of Business where he served several roles during his tenure. Blair has advised more than 100 companies, governments, and governments, and has published more than 50 books and articles. Thank you, Blair, for being here. Simon Hicks, on the other side, on the edge, uh, is the Harold Lasky Professor of Political Science at the London School of Economics and the Academic Director of the LSE Public Policy, Pub uh, Public Policy School. Simon is one of the leading researchers, teachers, and commentators on European politics in the UK. Thank you for being here. Michael Hirschman is an international recognized expert on matters relating to transparency, accountability, governance, litigation, and security. He founded the Fairfax Group and co-founded Transparency International. And finally, Julia, you all know her, I think, is the executive director of CPEC, the largest think tank in Argentina and one of our hosts today, this afternoon. 
Uh, she's a specialist in public policy research and project monitoring and evaluation, and she holds a PhD in political science from LSE, where Simon actually was the supervisor <laughs> of her thesis. I wanted to say that last night. They are coming from the past into the present, and now we are going to talk about the future. So th thank you all for joining us today. And let me open the conversation with a broad question, for Blair maybe the first one. Um, what is the best possible scene for the future of politics? And how, that maybe more importantly, how can we get tickets to, to watch that, to, to see that scene, or even to be in the cast? What so, do you think, Blair? So, so first of all, can I compliment Julia? I, I, I think that um, she took two courageous steps. The first is, to me, there are two questions that are the profound questions of this century. One of them is, what does it mean to be a human being? And the second one is, how are we going to govern ourselves? because those two issues are under attack in ways we've never seen before. The second thing she did was she actually has spoken to an audience of people who are data-driven empiricists about potential futures, right? Which is a pretty risky way to talk to this group. But actually, I think that's the only way to ask this question. Because actually, it's the things coming at us that we have to worry about, not the things we're experiencing now, right? And so, I just think she's courageous and I want to recognize her for that. So, so if you think about her two worlds and you think about how to answer that question, to me there's a how and a what, right? The how question, um, and it may be that I, you know, I just left my wife at home in 44 inches of rain from the hurricane in North Carolina, and so it may be that that's making me feel pessimistic, but I do worry that actually the dimensions can be either positive or negative, and they're pretty negative today. So let me use her first set as the example, which is, and, and my own country, sorry for that, but um, th they were on my mind as I was flying down here. So if you think about dispersed power, right, we clearly have dispersed power in the United States. It just isn't working, right? And the reason it isn't working is the parties are so fractured, we can't have a conversation among the dispersed elements, right? So my son and my daughter-in-law their biggest marital feud is a result of one listening to Fox and the other one listening to CNN, right? And so as a kind of trick on when I'm driving anywhere, I just turn back and forth and say, which world am I engaged with today, right? So, so, we're, so, the, so the, dif the, the dispersed power is fractured and so it can't engage itself, so we don't collaborate. So think about the condensed power, right? The problem with condensed power, so I, I was at home when the electricity was working during the hurricane, and, and actually, I realized that actually Google was everywhere, right? We had this Google Home, and we had Google driving our TV, and we were asking questions for Google. It was everywhere, right? And so I realized that actually, if I think about who's really governing my life, it isn't Washington, <laughs> right? It's Google, right? And, and so I think that this issue of condensed power is actually changing form, and we don't control it. Right. So then if I think about the inclusive exclusive, right? Clearly we're more we are inclusive still in the United States, right? We still are a democratic process, but I gotta tell you, look at the two candidates we generated for the for presidency, right? There was a bumper sticker before the election saying, I already hate my next president. <laughs> right? So what did inclusion get us? Right? It actually got us a bad choice. And I think that's happening more and more and more and more and more and more circles. And then funny if you think about exclusion. So I live in a city which, which when I left, came there in 1980 was a terrible, dismal place. It's now a thriving, fantastic place, but it turns out the original natives can't afford to live there anymore. So, so if I look at that, to me the issue we have to worry about related to the dimensions is not just where do we want to be in the quadrant system, but actually, how do we turn them positive versus negative? I think that's a hugely important governance question, right? Then the second one becomes, so let me use the second chart to actually think about where do I want to be, right? And, and if you could visualize it, I'd like there to be an isosceles triangle where the bottom of the triangle is really wide in the lower left quadrant, which is local small, and the top of the triangle is really, really tiny, global big. And actually, we situate ourselves there. Now, the reason I think we need global big is that if you think about Google dominating or that, the likes of that, we need an equivalent counterparty that has as much power as they do to control them. The problem is I don't want that party controlling my life. I want them controlling the big players. 
And I want the big players to actually have to resolve a paradox, which is be incredibly Argentinian in Argentina, incredibly Chinese in China, incredibly Russian in Russia, actually incredibly Buenos Aires in Buenos Aires, but then actually be global in the way that we need them to, to ensure consistency of sort of access and privacy and control. And then the other thing you have to think about is it is the imperative of every large organization, including our own, by the way, to get more efficient, which means we will take work out. The only answer to that problem is massive number of new small companies, and I want them to be local. All right? so, so in a sense, the image is sort of an isosceles triangle where you actually have local control trying to generate conversations that can be managed because they're not manageable at a national level, really, or an international level, but manageable because the constituents are neighbors and where the, the creation of the work is actually done by local enterprises that are part of that system with a thing that's enabling that that's governed globally. That's sort of where I'd like us to be, right? Hard to do, by the way, and there is no precedent for that. Okay, maybe we'll come back to you for, for the explanation. How do we do the, this? But first, Simon, Julia, Julia was mentioning that we might not be producing the politicians or maybe the institutions we need to navigate this world. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, it's a fascinating report. I, I'm going to talk about a, a, another dimension that's shifting in politics, which is, you know, for, for 100 years since the birth of industrial society, we thought about politics as essentially left versus right. The, you know, the left is about uh, redistributing wealth, increasing taxes, the right about cutting taxes and uh, more free markets, right? So this was a world we've been living in. And, and now in many places in the world, we've shifted away from that towards an elite which is in favor of the status quo, which is largely globalization, or we call it as a euphemism, open societies. And, and masses, large parts of the population in many countries across the world, whether it's the Philippines or Argentina or Brazil, through to the UK or the United States, who want more closed societies. And what I mean by closed societies is it's not the same everywhere. So a more populist left wants more closed economics, but is a bit more open when it comes to social questions. And, and a populist right they want more, more closed societies, and they're a little bit more varied in terms of their views on economics. Um, and part of, I think, what's driving this is not just individual inequality, it's, it's growing geographic inequality. So I think in many advanced democracies, it, it, the real growth in individual inequality, when you look at the Gini indices, was in the, was in the 90s and the, then the early 2000s, and in many places, it's actually been, using the Piketty data, it's been more or less flat for the last decade or so. But what has been really growing fast is regional inequality, all the indices of regional inequality. In a sense, in many places in the world, you've got three types of regions now. You've got regions that are benefiting massively from globalization, cities that are generating growth largely in two sectors, in financial services and related industries, and in the creative industries. And this is you know, creating jobs, creating elites, sucking in young people. This is what's happening in the triangle in North Carolina is exactly this. The rest of the country are two different types of re regions. One is cities or towns that are in industrial decline in lots of places with changing technology, changing manufacturing. Um, and the, the third area are aging rural populations. So little rural towns, often young people leave to go to big cities. Aging, these, and these are the, this is the, the coalition that's the classic populist coalition. So it's not just about you know, inequality and how we address inequalities. How do we address this regional inequality? How do we decentralize our economy? How do we pass decisions down to local communities? I think we need to think much more about varying the type of policy choices people are allowed to make locally. Is it okay that some local communities say, we don't want immigrants in my town? How can we have, you know, we have this, exactly this debate in the UK. London is saying, actually, can we have our own immigration policy, please? We don't care if the rest of the country doesn't want immigrants, but we do in London. And I think this is quite an interesting debate about how we think about decentralizing our policy mix, decentralizing some really radical choices that are not traditional economic left-right choices, but are new choices about open versus closed societies. And I think that's going to be what, how we resolve that, I think, is going to be the challenge uh, for the future. Thank you, Simon. And, and Michael, um, you know, in, in Latin America and in Argentina in particular, we are facing corruption scandals. You, you might have heard about them. And well, you are an expert in transparency. So what do you think is going to happen with us into the future? Is this going to be a real shift? Are we going to remember this moment as the, the, the shifting point or, or a starting point of something new?
One second. The mics. Yes, mic's I think still your mic me. is not working well. About anything, I guess. <laughs> 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 uh, now you can talk what about I, what whatever was, you want. I, I was saying is that I, I, I'm not going to talk about economic growth and, and I'm not going to talk about uh, technological advances and how that might impact the future of politics. Uh, I'm going to talk about a subject which is perhaps less diplomatic, which is not characteristic of anyone dealing with the G220 countries. Um, I want to talk about political tribalism. Because in order to, to, for us to understand what the future of politics is, we have to understand where we're at today. In the United States, in Europe, in Russia, in Latin America, Asia, the Middle East, Saudi Arabia. There are movements led by demagogues uh, who are exploiting people's fears, exploiting their prejudices, and taking their grievances to a new level to seize power around the world. It's also the case that these same leaders, once they take power, become the new version of our old kleptocrats. And it's almost impossible for us to uh, know when the decisions of government end and where the interests of the kleptocrats begin. But them being kleptocrats is, in some respects, good news. Them being corrupt, in some respects, is good news. And I'll, I'll get to that in a, in a moment. But we have to understand, this is not a na national problem. This is a global problem. There, it's a movement. And there are people throughout the world who are facilitating this movement in many, many different countries, not just the countries that we live in. Um, someone mentioned our president, not by name, he happens to be named Donald Trump. Uh, I've looked over many of his speeches. Um, I don't think he's ever mentioned the word ethics. I don't think he's ever mentioned the word values. And in fact, he's ridiculed our anti-barbary laws, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. So if we're to see a different future, we have to take steps today. And these steps have to be also international. They also have to cross borders. And what it can't be, it cannot be advocating the status quo that brought us to where we are today. Too many empty promises to reduce corruption. Too many empty promises to reduce poverty, to improve education, to improve medical services, to improve the overall economy. That's why we find ourselves where we are today, because of the false promises of the politicians of the past. But there is hope, because you know we have a common set of beliefs, a common set of values. We all want our children to be healthy. We all want them to have a good education and to have a job. We all want them to breathe clean air. We all want them to drink clean water. And we all want them to live in peace. And so it is more incumbent now on many of the organizations and their members in this room to come together and to make sure that civil society is prepared to meet these challenges so that we aren't as pessimistic as we may be today about the future of politics. One of the things, what I mentioned earlier, not so bad that some of these demagogues are also kleptocrats corrupt. And the reason I say that is because that is a unifying call to the people to rise up and to overthrow these people. But we can't do that relying on the same old, tired definition of corruption that we've been using for the last 50 years. Something like uh, influencing a public politician uh, or improperly influenced. No, we have to understand that corruption 
is not just white collar crime. It's not just financial crime. It's a crime against humanity. And that's what it, this is about. Our future is about protecting human rights around the world. These demagogues, and I think you know who I'm talking about, the first thing they do when they get in office is throw their opponents in jail, throw journalists in jail, or worse, kill journalists, crack down on civil rights, crack down on human rights. Corruption is a violation of human rights, and we must create a, a, a global movement to fight it. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Simon, you were mentioning that we need uh, more local governments, but there are some issues that have been arising here that are, are quite global. Corruption, maybe, uh, but some others. Climate change, Julia, Julia was mentioning some mega trends. Uh, how do you think that global and local can combine? Yeah, I mean, this, it, it's a tension that's existed for a long time, but I think it's really come to a head in that, you know, markets and technology are pushing things more and more global. Um, and, you know, it's a technology, the, we in Europe tried to design an architecture to govern our continent that resolved that tension. So we could have a market on a continental scale and a set of institutions to govern that market in Brussels. But politics and people's choices are increasingly local. It really struck me, traveling around the UK in the build-up to the Brexit debate, how all the conversations were local. In my community, this is happening. And it's, you know, I think the jury is out in the research on the determinants or the drivers of why people go out and vote for nationalists or populists or demagogues. On the one side are people who say it's really just about economics. It's just about the fact that we've had austerity, we've had growing inequality, we've had downturn, and either at the individual level or at the local aggregate level, we can identify the economic correlates of voting for this. But the other side, I think, has shown that actually that only tells part of the story. Another part of the story is a real cultural backlash against elites, against globalization, against migrants, against rapidly changing local communities. One of the biggest predictors, for example, in the UK for voting for Brexit and in the US voting for Trump is not the absolute number of migrants, but the change in the number of migrants in a local area. These are people reacting to rapid change in their local communities, feeling, they have no say over this. My local community is changing really rapidly. I wasn't asked about this. I have no influence over this. I have no way of changing or shaping this. And that's when you get this kind of knee-jerk reaction. So I, it's, it's a challenge. I haven't got the answers. But I think we've, we've too easily said that we just have to Mark the economy and technology means we have to have bigger and bigger markets and Europe, transnational, supranational, and global institutions to govern those things without thinking about the consequences of, of global economic and technological change and what is happening in local communities and how they deal with that. And I haven't got any answers, unfortunately, but I think this is trying to shine a lens on one of the major challenges I think we've got. But it, but you, you were saying that everything is changing so rapidly for the, for the society, for the citizens. How was it for, for you, Julia, and for you, Blair, to try to uh, imagine these future scenarios in such a changing world? Uh, and Well, you know, we've I, I we've let me just tell, tell the yeah. audience that uh, the, these uh, prospective scenarios were invented by the militaries to go to war, to try to imagine how, how the, the war was going to end, or, or what's <laughs> the best strategy in a war. And you are quite, in some way, describing a war, you know, a, a very conflicted world. So how was it? Well, it was, uh, we had a lot of fun, yeah. right? <laughs> so, well, well, some of uh, there, are Ramiro Albrieu, Martin Rapetti, you, you, you came also. Um, I think that differently from what happened when it wa they were started for uh, in the Second World War, now with this very, very disruptive and very rapid uh, changes, it's not that uh, easy to see, well, this is what we have at the present, and this is, and this is the future that is uh, far ahead from us. I think that uh, very, very uh, dramatic change also changes us the perspective. We know some things of the future, and we, know, we don't know some things of the present. So I think there is now a kind of a mix of those uh, ideas that were a common standard of past, present, and future. Uh, it was very interesting to have people from different uh, backgrounds and disciplines, and hopefully it's the beginning of a journey. <laughs> so
So there's a lot to keep working on this. What you, what you think? So, so it was a lot of fun, by the way. It actually, <laughs> and, and actually, it was interesting because it was unnatural for most of the people to try to do, right? Um, but to me, what was interesting was the conversations at dinner. We, we, we went out that night after the first day, and, and the answer, the, the reaction was, wow. You know, and, and, and actually, we had sort of two, to me, three reactions that were interesting that actually been picked up on. The first is the uncertainty this world is creating creates a platform for people with simple ideas to con us. And that's really, really dangerous. And if we don't somehow create a new, more complex, but, but valid representation of what we need to govern ourselves, that will happen, right? And I remember I was walking with you to dinner and I said, so you need to help write a simple story about the complexity we just created. And she said, no, Blair, what we need is a simple, a complex story that people can understand to represent the complexity. Because the problem is simplicity creates demagoguery, right? And so that was the first reaction. Second reaction, I think it was interesting, was um, how do we get there from here? You know, just how do we get there from here? Because essentially, it's really the point that was raised, two points, which is the people who actually have the established intellectual frameworks are, have the established intellectual frameworks, and they don't let them go easily, right? And then there's a whole series of people who actually have a set of very unique and different answers we just aren't even paying attention to, right? Mm -hmm. So, so how do you how do you take those two things and put them together? And and so the, the, you know we we kept dinner going till I think two in the morning, and the restaurant finally had to kick us out because we talked about those questions. It was really <laughs> really interesting. So uh, let me uh, take this question for all of you. How do we get to a more optimistic place, or or, or at least can how we, can we be a little bit more optimistic and and start? Uh, walking towards uh, a more interesting future. Um, you told me that, uh, Michael, that you are not going to be diplomatic, but maybe we can try to, to see if we can share a common uh, path to, a, to more, a more optimistic future. Well, I'm intrigued by the comment about uh, people uh, being conned by simple ideas. Uh, I find that many of the people that are being conned are people that want to be conned yeah. because they're disaffected. Uh, they have real grievances. And to simply say that they are stupid or that they are uh, uneducated in some way it is not good enough. We, we are going to have to address the insecurities that this group of people have, which cause them to latch on to issues, burning issues of the day, uh, like immigration. Um, our education system, in many respects, has failed us in this regard. And, and in particular, I'm talking about our primary school education. Uh, if I might use the United States as an example, when I was growing up, um, we used to sit at the dinner table and, and I get a very simple explanation about honesty uh, from my parents, don't cheat, don't steal, don't lie. Um, Nowadays, the, the parents in the United States are often too busy or too distracted to impart values and ethics uh, to our primary school children. And so it does fall on to the teachers, but the teachers are very reluctant, uh, or perhaps in some cases too politically correct to go in that way. But whether you teach math or biology or history or English, you can always insert issues related to values and honesty. Uh, you may not be able to use the word corruption because small kids don't necessarily understand that. Uh, we need to get back to basis uh, in the education system to create a, the next generation which doesn't feel the deep sense of insecurity and disenfranchisement that I'm seeing today, not only in the United States, but in, in other countries. Same. Tell you a, a similar anecdote from the UK. So in Sunderland, in the northeast of England, there's Nissan factory. It's one of the largest car factories in Europe. And Sunderland was the tipping point on the night of the Brexit vote. Sunderland voted to leave the EU. And Lisa Nandy, who's a British Labour politician, tells a story of she's from a local uh, area close to Sunderland. During the Brexit debate, she was asked by the 
the Japanese employers to come and talk to the factory floor workers. Because the employers were totally opposed to Brexit, the, the leadership, uh, a lot of the shop stewards or more senior workers were opposed to Brexit, but a lot of the shop floor workers were in favour. So she stood on the platform and she said, look, if you vote for Brexit, there will be friction in our trade, the, our just-in-time production will collapse. Apparently they have only one hour's worth of production on their factory shelves at any one time, and they have something like 15,000 trucks a week that arrive through the, the channel, and stopping this... A 15-minute delay will increase production costs by a million pounds a week. We'll have to move the factory. You'll all, you lose your jobs. And one, of, one guy put his hand up and said, don't you think we know that? We're not stupid. We know that. But we want to vote for Brexit because of what is happening to our community. There's no opportunities for our kids. We don't th expect our jobs to be here in 20 years because of changing technology anyway. But you guys down in London, you're not listening to us. We've seen rapid change over the last 20 years in our community. I'm not voting to save my job at Nissan. I'm voting so you guys will listen to us and start paying attention to these parts of the country that have been in industrial decline, that are having rapid social change, that are, you know, and it was a real eye-opener to her who thought you could just make a, a, an economic interest argument. And they were not voting on these. They were voting on much bigger, broader issues than she thought they were. So I agree. It's not just about them being uneducated or not having information. It's about feeling a sense of belonging or a sense of community. And when Theresa May made the speech at the Conservative Party conference, said the new politics in Britain is between, you know, I'm no longer listening to the people who are the citizens of nowhere. I'm now going to start listening to the citizens of somewhere. And, I, I, you know, we all took a step back and said, we're all the citizens of nowhere, the elites in London. But what she meant was those factory floor workers in Sunderland. And this really resonated with large parts of the country. Actually, there you have the, the complex narrative made simple, but just DCI with, <laughs> with his hand up. Uh, Julia, you mentioned this morning that we might need new, a, a new narrative, that we had liberalism and now we are left with nothing. Do you think uh, some of what you're saying here remind me of that? Do you need new narratives, a new way to tell the story of our world and, and where are we heading? Yeah, I think that, well, and maybe if I take now the conversation to the T20 and what all this would mean for the T20, if local identities are going to be the core of our identities, well, what are we going to expect from the G20? What is uh, we're going to, if you're going to all the time be waiting for immediate responses that because we are, we, we didn't, I, I know you, you told me the other day this uh, uh, indicator of how many seconds we, we cannot wait until we answer a WhatsApp message, or at least in Argentina, uh, WhatsApp is so, so heavily used. And because we wait, we cannot wait three seconds to uh, wait for the answer and we think something bad is going on. Well, the same reaction we could uh, expect from politicians, from government. So if we are waiting for that reaction in three seconds, are we going to wait uh, for the T20 to take a decision on something that is uh, taking globally? But when we are all looking at local identities, at our local uh, perceptions, so I think uh, m most of, this, um, of these issues have to do with uh, what is going to impact on the G20, and I think many pressing discussions should be taken on this. Excellent. I think we have two questions coming from the audience. Let's see if we can see them. They are coming from the streaming. Uh, let me know if they are there. No, okay. <laughs> Maybe they are coming. <laughs> They, they told me they, they were. Okay, so let me ask you one more question. How, how do you think this uh, conversation... Oh, here they are. Thank you <laughs> to all of you. More than two. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought there were only two. Okay, let's, let's try. Uh, we have seven minutes left, so if we have short answers, we, we can try and, and answer all of them. Uh, the first one, are political systems ready to govern a digital economy? Who wants to take it? Let me read all of them and just think, take one of each of you. I'll, yeah. do, no, I'll do number two. <laughs> okay. <laughs> just, you read them and you let me know. I read them for all of them. Do you foresee more integration or more disintegration in Europe during the next years? What will be the consequence of an automated world <laughs> for global governments and for the role of the G20? That's quite a big one. How can emerging countries benefit from multi multilateral cooperation? Simon, if you want to start with the second one. Yeah, so I think in the short term, Brexit uh, may actually be a boost to the process of European integration without Britain at the table. 
Uh, there's a real sense of solidarity, the certain issues now for Europe to move forward on common defense and these types of issues. Uh, there's a growing conversation between France and Germany about deeper integration in the Eurozone, uh, common migration policies and so on. What I worry about for Europe in the medium term is even though Brexit in the short term is going to be a bigger hit for the UK than it is for the EU, at a certain point, Britain will be a model outside the EU. So we have the Swiss model, the Norwegian model, there's going to be a British model. And even if the British model is not hugely successful, it still becomes a pole of attraction, alternative, an alternative way of doing things, an alternative relationship with the EU. And this, I think, is very challenging to, to parties and populist parties in certain parts of Europe, Sweden in particular. Sweden has very close relationships with the UK, close relationships with Norway. I can see a conversation starting in Sweden about they, maybe they should follow the British way. In Hungary, in the Czech Republic, I think a lot of the elites in Brussels and Berlin and Paris are very worried about giving a deal to the UK that would be seen as potentially a pole of attraction. So in the short term, I think it might be good for European integration. In the medium term, I really worry about it leading to a gradual unraveling. Excellent, and thank you for doing in one minute. Who wants to take another one? I'll do the first one. Great. The answer is no. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and, thank you, Blair. And, and, and Let's I go to the next one. <laughs> no, two sorry. Quickies, two quickies on it. First is, I do not think we are reflecting enough on what it is doing to us and what we're becoming as a result. And that is a huge opportunity for the T20, right? And then the second piece I think is, we actually have to figure out what it means to create a national government that enables localities to be successful and a global government that enables national governments to allow localities to be successful. Because it turns out in locales, we're to the point he creates, which is, are, do my kids have a good school? Are my home safe? Is this a nice place to live? I mean, it's the stuff we can all agree on, and then we stop the debate, right, and focus. And then we can bring digital to bear on that. But right now, we're not ready for either of those. Okay. Julia, do you want to take uh, emerging countries? Michael? or uh, Michael, which one? I, um, I actually can, I have a stiff neck. And I can only see half the question. <laughs> and I certainly can't remember them, but I know we're running out of time. And, and I'd, I'd like to just uh, ask, I know many of you are in the NGO community, but are there any uh, people out there that are involved in, in business, enterprise, uh, small business, large business? Raise your hand. Well, good. I, I want to make the point that you are part of civil society. <laughs> uh, are there any government employees in the audience? Raise your hand. Well, you too are part of <laughs> civil society. You know, we at Transparency International, we prided ourselves at the very beginning in the early 90s of trying to bring together these three columns, uh, civil society, business, and, and government. And I've come to the conclusion we shouldn't even look at them as columns. Uh, we all live on this, this earth, and we all are citizens of our countries. And we all are part of civil society, and we have got to cross the borders between these three different columns and work together uh, to make the changes that need to be made, whether they're digitally related or whether they are, are politically related. Julia, is this helpful for emerging countries, what we're doing here today? Yeah, but I wanted to take uh, Blair's point on question sure. one. Go ahead. Uh, my answer is no, and that is why we started this process. Um, and I think that economists are much more used to having this uh, simulation and uh, analysis of models to predict future outcomes. Well, I lived in Argentina many times without <laughs> having the correct answer, but uh, I think we as political scientists and all who are thinking about political systems need to start thinking out of, uh, out of these uh, very structured uh, uh, ways and try to devise scenarios. And probably you were talking, Simon, this morning about we are not having evidence-based policy, but policy-based evidence. I think that in a way, uh, it's not that we don't need evidence-based analysis of politics, but we need uh, complementarity of uh, having evidence based is always the evidence about the past because uh, we cannot have evidence about the future but we need to work on a different analysis and try to anticipate future 
uh, trends, and I think it's part of what we are trying to do. Thank you very much, and unfortunately, our flight time is over. <laughs> we are landing into the near future, 50 minutes after we departed, but hopefully we are carrying in our luggage some fresh, interesting ideas about what a more distant future might bring to us. Thank you very much to you all for being here. Thank you. What a great session on the future of politics. We would like to thank all the speakers for taking part today. It is now time for the second keynote session of the day, and this will be given by Jeffrey Sachs, professor and director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we start now with this uh, key second keynote session of the day, and this will be given by Jeffrey Sachs, professor and director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University. To introduce him, please welcome Gerardo de la Paulera, director of the Bunge and Born Foundation and member of CPEC Board of Directors. Please welcome him. ¿Se escucha o no? Sí, ahora sí. Ok, so, uh, good afternoon to everybody. This is the last uh, session of the day. So, I think uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs needs no introduction, but however, I will go by the manual. Uh, so, Professor Sachs is a world-renowned professor of economics, leader in sustainable development, senior UN advisor, best-selling author, and syndicated columnists whose monthly newspaper columns appear in more than 100 countries. He's a co-recipient of the 2015 Blue Planet Prize, which is the leading global prize for environmental leadership. He's a member in the Institute of Medicine, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences of the US, of the Harvard Society of Fellows, and he's a fellow of the World Econometric Society this is amongst many other distinctions. As I said, he's a prolific author. His recent books include 
to move the world GFK's quest for peace of 2013, the age of sustainable development 2015, and a very challenging book lately, Building the New American Economy, Smart, Fair, and Sustainable 2017. So Professor Sachs is currently director of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network under the auspices of the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, and he serves as the director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University, and he is university professor at the same university, and prior to joining Columbia in a previous life, Jeff spent over 20 years as a professor at Harvard University, most recently as the Gallant Stone Professor of International Trade. So he has many periods, like, 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 like Picasso, you know, the blue period, the cubic period, <laughs> the cubist period, and so you're in the latest, uh, no? I mean, so please join me in welcoming so Professor Jeffrey Sachs. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Right. 20 minutes. So 20 minutes, uh, Jeff. Yep. Thank you very much. I'm in the period of abstract expressionism now, Fantastic. so uh, if I make any sense, then I have failed. Uh, but I want to uh, thank our wonderful hosts, uh, CPEC and Kari, uh, not only for the invitation on behalf of all of us, but for the absolutely extraordinary leadership during this year. So can we give them an incredible round of applause, please? The T20 is really remarkable, and it is becoming a global force for good. And I think that the presence here of so many leading organizations around the world speaking a common language about the direction that we need is extraordinary, vital, uh, and uh, increasingly essential in a world where the politicians don't share that language uh, and where politics is obviously in serious contestation now. That's what I want to talk about, what our role needs to be, not only in this G20, but in the G20s ahead, because what the T20 has evolved into is a very vital force for redirecting our current trajectory. And your voices need to be heard, and our collective voice needs to be heard. If you listen to session after session, there is a common underpinning of direction. I think it's fair to say, I won't put words in your mouth, but I believe that it is fair to say that Almost everybody here believes in universal values, believes in rule of law, and believes in sustainable development, meaning a world economy that is not only prosperous, but socially inclusive and environmentally sustainable. I think it's fair to say that just about everybody here would subscribe to the Sustainable Development Goals and Agenda 2030, and would subscribe to the Paris Climate Agreement as two absolutely essential directions for us. Indeed, I would go so far as to say that our challenge that we're discussing is not really the debate about ends, but the discussion of means in an increasingly complicated world. I don't think that the big challenge is that we just don't know in the complexity what to do or even more importantly where to go, but we grapple with the question that with a world that is not in the direction of climate safety, with a world that is not in the direction of social inclusion, which in a world which is not on a trajectory to achieve the sustainable development goals, what should we do? So I don't believe that our challenge is purpose, direction on the horizon, but I think it is the very practical challenge of a world that is in many ways threatening to spin out of control 
and at the least is on a trajectory very different from the one that we would subscribe to as being vital for human well-being, for the vulnerable on the planet, and for the future. The challenge, in other words, is how to redirect processes, systems, resource flows in a direction that we would largely share and subscribe to. The truth is, of course, that every one of the values that I enunciated is under assault right now. The idea of universalism or even multilateralism is under attack. Of course, starting with my own government, the United States, which doesn't accept that principle as a starting point. The idea of a global rule of law is absolutely under attack. Again, I'll cite my own government, but there are others too, which do not believe that one follows the UN charter or that one's military actions should be dictated by the UN Security Council. The US formal position is, if you don't vote with us, we don't care. We're doing it anyway. I'm not putting words in their mouth, those are their words. This is a direct challenge to the idea of a rule-based system. And the idea of sustainable development is under assault. Again, I can't help referring to my own government, not only because it is my government, but it's also the most powerful country in the world. It is the country that has announced it's pulling out of the Paris Climate Agreement. It is the country that has, an, that has not ratified a UN treaty in a generation of any significance. It is the country that is uh, the single country to pull out of the JCPOA, the agreement with Iran on nuclear weapons that was then ratified by the UN Security Council, which makes it international law for all 193 UN member states. The idea, therefore, of sustainable development, which I would presume is a universally shared set of values within this room, is not a shared set of values at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. I try not to mention that in the United States, because if they don't hear about it, maybe they won't attack it. But certainly, it's not a matter of convincing, because what the Trump administration wants is to dig for coal and frack for gas and oil and maximize carbon emissions. And they're not alone, because many other powerful governments also want more fossil fuels and neglect the implications of that. And then we have the disasters like Hurricane Maria last year, killing 3,000 people at least, and then the president saying he doesn't believe it because the last journal article he ever read was, well, never. So he doesn't understand the research and he doesn't understand the ideas, but he doesn't care. And now we have Hurricane Florence, killing dozens. We had a massive typhoon in the Philippines, all of them gravely intensified by human-induced climate change. My guru, Dr. James Hansen, sent a, an email around this afternoon explaining the climatology of these intense storms on the U.S. seaboard. But this is not the view in the powerful circles. This is what we are grappling with. We're grappling with challenges of power. And we need to face how we're going to address that. I think it's right to say that there have been three geopolitical phases since World War II that we should try to understand as we grapple with this challenge of global politics. 
the first from 1945 to 1989, and since uh, this is such a profound trivialization and simplification, I ask for your forbearance uh, and I, give, I ask for your uh, 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 forgiveness uh, in advance. But just to say that during that period, from 1945 to 1989, there were two dominant impulses playing simultaneously. One was the U.S. desire to build a multilateral system. And the greatest genius of American political history, Franklin Roosevelt, was the one that got us in that direction with the United Nations and then the family of the UN institutions. And another great uh, American genius and activist, his wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, made it possible to have a universal declaration of human rights in 1948. That impulse, which was seen for decades as for the U.S. benefit and for the world benefit, naturally was alongside and often in conflict with U.S. great power politics, let's face it. The U.S. built a multilateral system and it sometimes denigrated or ignored the U.S. multilateral system. I grew up during the Vietnam War, but uh, during my lifetime, how many dozens of governments have we overthrown? Uh, how many bullets have we put through the head of political leaders around the world? How much uh, terrible crisis uh, was caused during that period by the U.S. and in the Cold War by the U.S. Uh, counterpart, uh, the Soviet Union, up to 1989. But it was a period where, broadly speaking, at a rhetorical and often a substantive level, the idea of universalism and rule of law were seen by the U.S. as important and worth building. And much was built. Then came 1989 to 1991, and it ushered in a new era. The new era that I hoped for was Mikhail Gorbachev's vision of a common home across Eurasia from Rotterdam to Vladivostok. That was not the vision of the U.S. security state. The vision of the U.S. security state was of a unipolar U.S. world, the global colossus that now was unchallenged by anybody else who would clean up the remaining Soviet, now Russian, allies in Syria, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and so forth in Libya, clean up the mess around, and then the U.S., maybe it would be a universal state, but it would be a U.S. dominant global society with unipolarity. It was, in many ways, a fantasy world, of course. It was a fantasy world because no country, even a country as powerful as the United States, when it has 4.4% of the world's population should dream of dictating to the other 95.6% and believing that somehow there's a global consensus around one country's leadership. Of course, there never was. And, of course, no country should neglect the fact that its power in relative terms was certainly diminishing as other countries, and of course, most importantly, China, was rising in power to the point where around 2011 China became in absolute terms measured in international dollars the largest single economy in the world, turning out hundreds of thousands of PhDs and rapidly mastering the new technologies. But I would say up until 2016, this 1989 to 2016, strange world was still accompanied once in a while by commitments to multilateralism. President Obama, of course, more than George W. Bush. I wouldn't exaggerate even for President Obama, who launched several major unilateral wars, CIA operations, drone attacks absolutely outside of the UN framework. 
but he was a multilateralist on climate change, to be sure, uh, and uh, he was a supporter of the United Nations in broad terms, though often not in practice. Now we have another phase. We don't know how long it will last and what it really represents. We don't know for sure whether it is uh, a deep new path, whether it is a prelude to disaster, which it could be, or whether it is a mere interlude that returns to some vague sense of multilateralism, even though surely a weak one in the U.S. context, and that's Mr. Trump and the idea of America first. I dwell on my country because we cannot talk about any of these issues without understanding the geopolitical context. And the geopolitical context now is that the most powerful country, militarily still, and absolutely uh, still a mega economy and technological power, now explicitly rejects all of the three premises of our meeting. Explicitly rejects universalism, explicitly rejects the rule of law, because it's now the art of the deal. It is not the rule of law. And explicitly rejects sustainable development. We are at a period in history that we have seen before and know that it's a dangerous period. The United States, with its pluses and its profound minuses, was a kind of, in political science speak, hegemonic power for several decades. This is clearly no longer the case. There is no single dominant power right now. There is a very powerful United States cut loose from the moorings of multilateralism. There are powerful other states, notably China, Russia, and of course others that are nuclear states with the enormous power, scope, determination of resources, ability to extend military power abroad. And the relations of those states is absolutely up for question right now. When I was a student, the book we read was Charles Kindleberger's famous book about the interwar period, when he noted that the British hegemony had diminished, the U.S. was now the largest economy, but not yet a global leader, and in that context, the chaos of a trade war and a prolonged Great Depression occurred during the 1930s, and then of course, uh, devolved into World War II in the midst of the ensuing chaos. We are now in such a world, and the G20 represent the 20 largest countries in that world, and the future is now up for grabs. The United States tried to break the G20 consensus on climate, for example, last year in Germany. It did not work. 19 held, one broke. So far, so good. But on the other hand, consider climate in this G20, hardly mentioned. Consider many of the other issues in this G20, hardly mentioned. Fear of the United States, what will they do? We want Mr. Trump to have a good time in Buenos Aires. There is a lot of consternation right now, as there should be. And many of the other G20 countries have strong national and nationalistic leaders who also under the spiral of the prisoner's dilemma, believe if they're not playing by international rules, how should I? So remember that multilateralism is not the only stable equilibrium. It's hardly a stable equilibrium. 
Balance of power, by the way, is also not a stable equilibrium if history has taught us anything. There is no such thing as the balance of power. There is the contestation of power. There is fear of others. But there's always the chance of an imbalance of power leading to war, either by the one who feels the power waning or the one who feels the power waxing and is afraid that the lead will hold back. And so this is where we are today. And the T20 represents a powerful and crucial voice <clears throat> to say to the world, we are not bereft of a framework and a direction. We are not so befuddled and confused and hopelessly overtaken by technological change or inequality or other challenges that we can't move forward together. Indeed, I would argue that more than ever, especially in a period of multipolarity, the notion of universal, rule-based, and directed cooperation directed towards the three pillars of sustainable development, meaning economic development, social justice, and environmental sustainability, are precisely what we need to keep the world safe. It's hard to imagine, for me, any other way. And we are fortunate for one thing in this very difficult time. Somehow, in the midst of all of this confusion and perpetual wars and rising inequality and runaway climate change, the world was able to reach universal agreements in 2015 on the way forward. That is not a simple matter. And it's not one that will be revisited in our generation. Either these goals stay as our goals and that we work to implement them, or we will have no goals agreed and we will be in a struggle of power. Have no doubt about it. So I believe that our core commitment should be to the things that we have agreed recently. And we've agreed on them because they are good and they are right. And they commanded a universal assent, albeit universal before the arrival of the present US administration, for a reason. Every government could look at Agenda 2030 and say, you know that applies to me. Every government could look at the Paris Climate Agreement and say, you know, that makes sense for us collectively. And Mr. Trump's fantasy world, where he said that is uh, unfair to the United States, just proves once again the man does not read, because it is a perfectly symmetrical agreement. It has nothing to do with uh, any particular country being held apart from any other country. So the very idea that this is unfair to the United States is a kind of fantasy, but of course it's not simply fantasy. It is the fact that the Republican Party in the United States is owned and operated by the oil and gas industry. It is corruption, and it is corruption that was whispered to the president and he said, yes, fine, we will pull out of the Paris Climate Agreement because that's how our politics works. So I believe that what we need to do as thinking institutions is start from the notion that everything we've discussed today, and I think it's been brilliant discussion, and a very deep discussion, and a very rich discussion, starts with a remarkably shared agenda, not a confused agenda, 
but an agenda of purpose and an agenda that supports the very things that the world has adopted. And that gives us the most important way to cooperate. And I believe our job is, therefore, multiple. First, to remind our governments and our politicians that these goals were adopted for a reason. The reason of human well-being today and in the future. They are temporary occupants of office. Not one of them owns their country. Not one of them owns their politics. They are temporary occupants of office. That's all. They're there to serve the well-being of all of us, not themselves. And so the first thing is they need reminding and frankly, when the United States says, we don't want to talk about X, Y, and Z, it's probably a sign that X, Y, and Z are even more important. And we should not be shy for one moment of talking about climate change and our growing disaster, or talking about the transformations that we need, or the profound inequalities of power and wealth in the world. Second, we need to think very practically and pragmatically together and at the country level how can these goals be achieved not in the sense especially of you being amateur politicians i don't think that's our most interesting job actually our most interesting job is to understand what would it mean what instruments can we use how can we move to decarbonization why should this country not be fracking for gas and oil? Why should the United States move to its vast renewable energy resources and so on? How can we narrow income inequalities given the voluminous evidence of how the fiscal system can be used to reduce income inequalities? We're think tanks. We can think, that's our job. Governments do not think, and clearly they don't think it's their job. And so that, I think, is a second very important role for us, is to be specific and targeted. And we know that there are vital areas that we have discussed, sustainable agriculture. But understand, part of our job is to understand the real power, the real interests, and the real corruption. Tax reform, absolutely essential as one of the key issues that we must take on because the amount of tax corruption is simply staggering. How else did $30 trillion end up in tax havens? And whose tax havens are those? Those are the United States and UK, first and foremost. They made these tax havens as a game for their wealthy. So as think tanks, we have to discuss dispassionately what's really going on here. By the way, you look at the corruption in my country, which is staggering because we have, a, we have a real organized crime leader in the White House right now. We do. But I mean it literally, that's for decades. He's worked with hot money for 20 years. And look at Mr. Manafort. Everything is a shell corporation. Everything is a game. These shell corporations are a shame on the G20. They can be closed down. If we don't know beneficial ownership of corporations, we're lost for sure. Let's get real with what's happening. This is a game of the rich, by the rich, and for the rich. And it's impossible to have accountability if you can set up shell corporations, put them in the name of a hairdresser in Kiev, which is the story in the New York Times yesterday, who found out that tens of millions of dollars were flowing through accounts under his name as CEO of a company, of course, that he never heard of, based on identity theft by Mr. Manafort. And that is the president's campaign leader of the United States of America. And by the way, what wasn't said is the United States facilitates shell corporations. 
And almost all of Mr. Trump's backing for the last 15 years was Russian hot money coming in through shell corporations. We know this. So these are choices that we're making, but we as think tanks need to be clear about what's happening. Jeff, Jeff. And then finally, to end, we need to help the public to understand. This is part of our responsibility. Public outreach and awareness that we have shared global goals, that our problems more than ever are global, that they cannot be solved at local scale. I'm sorry. These are not small as beautiful problems. These are global scale cooperative systems problems. $30 trillion didn't flow to the bank accounts because of local scale, nor did $40 trillion get, uh, 40 trillion, uh, 40 billion tons, excuse me, of CO2 get pumped into the atmosphere with small as beautiful. We are talking about global scale systems that need fixing globally. We need to help everybody in the world understand this. And we need to help everybody understand that a central plank globally agreed is justice. It's fairness. For the people in the northern England towns emptying out that we heard about in the last session, for the people in the US Midwest, there was no justice from either party. They were left on their own. But sustainable development is not only about the environment and economic development, it is about social justice. Let's work together. This is a remarkable global force now. Again, thank you, Kari and Sipek, for bringing us together. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Professor Sachs. We have, a, we have time for a few questions. Is there any question for Professor Sachs? Yes, here. Here. We take three questions. On. Thanks, Jeff. Extremely David. provocative, as always. Since you're in Latin America, I have a question in terms of the T20, the G20, and countries working together. Venezuela, what do you think can be done and what do you think maybe should have been done that hasn't been done and can be done in the future to prevent further recurrences of that kind of event taking place in other countries? Most importantly, no external intervention by force, by subterfuge, by uh, uh, plotting, Absolutely none. This has to be worked out within Venezuela. Now I can tell you, and the United States stay as far away as possible. The US is allergic to regime change. Our most basic failed institution in American history, certainly American modern history, is the CIA. Stay clear of this absolutely. This is the most important thing. Now, I have to say, by the way, it is not easy to bankrupt our, uh, Venezuela. I couldn't imagine that the most skilled economists in the world would ever come up with a successful plan to bankrupt Venezuela. So you have to give a lot of credit to Mr. Chavez and to Mr. Madero. What a disaster. What profound mismanagement, what recklessness. And I met Mr. Chavez almost the first day of office and I explained to him one thing, don't leave your currency overvalued, don't think that it's forever your oil reserves, diversify your economy, create new exports. I went home and I watched over the next 15 years how he did 100% the opposite. And then Maduro is simply uh, bearing down violently to hold on to this. So this is ugly. It is a, a unbelievable phenomenon, and it's got to be sorted out internally. This is the only principle that I would say. Uh, and when there is 
internal peace and solution, and it's got to be sorted out peacefully. And when there is that possibility, then the neighborhood can help because the financial crisis is profound. The hyperinflation will be one of the highest in the history of the world. And Venezuela will need help after its self-destruction. But they will have to come with a society that is ready for help from outside. When that happens, we really ought to help. We have, we have time for the last question. The last question from the audience. Yes, here. Here. So, former a foreign minister from Germany, Joska Fischer, has said, you know, he's not sure whether we're going to a duopoly or to a change of guard with China taking over from the United States. What's your point of view on that? We will not have a new global hegemon. Uh, this will not be the history of the British Empire, the American Empire, now the Chinese Empire. It doesn't add up uh, in any uh, manner. We will be in a multipolar world that is either sustainable or facing disaster, but not a new world hegemon. And the reason is that uh, the arithmetic, the demographic arithmetic and the economic arithmetic and the technological arithmetic. We are in a multipolar world. I pray for Europe to hold together, despite Mr. Bannon and Mr. Trump playing games, because we need a strong European Union. The United States, I hope we have a North American free trade area still, rather than the nonsense that has been going on. I hope we have a strong South Asia because India will be the largest, most populous country in the world. It will be a rapidly growing economy with great capacity. And it should make peace with Pakistan and Bangladesh and make a South Asia that can work together. And I hope we have a strong Northeast Asia, not with an American-led dividing line between Japan and Korea on one side and China on the other, but an integrated region of China, Japan, Korea as what would be the largest integrated market and technologically the leading center of the world, actually, if you add up total patenting and total R&D, it would be phenomenal. There's also great complementarity between Japan, Korea, and China economically. And so I hope that good peace in Northeast Asia, led by all of the countries of Northeast Asia, can play a role. But then you have a multipolar world. And of course, Latin America is a strong piece of that, and the African Union should be a strong piece of that. So I believe in a globalization of regions because the logic of our problems is we need strong regional cooperation within a global framework. All of our watersheds, our riversheds, our renewable energy are at a transnational scale. The United States best not solve its renewable energy problem other than in cooperation also with Mexico and Canada. And in Asia, of course, the Mekong or the Ganges or the Brahmaputra or the other great rivers are flowing through multiple countries. So we cannot do this country by country under any circumstances. And Africa, which has the population of India and China, is 54 polities for one reason only. And that's because in 1885, the Europeans carved it up but it's 54 countries that are too small to reach the scale. So we need a strong, vibrant African Union as well. So global, but built on regions that are taking practical decisions on energy systems, transport systems, fiber, uh, watershed management, ecosystems, movement of people, and 
no country will be able to dominate that kind of world. The question, though, is Kissinger might say we should have a 19th century balance of power among those regions. I, unfortunately, in my mind, dwell nothing more than on August 1914 and on the failure of a balance of power. And we cannot afford one more failure in this world. We had two, bloodier than the next, the next one's the end. So we're in a no-error world at the global scale. And that requires us being smart enough to understand we let the genie out of the bag with nuclear weapons. We're in a different world. We can't afford to fail. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Professor. Great. Thank you very much for, uh, for being here uh, today. Let's have a picture. A picture. Good. <laughs> very good. Many thanks to Jeffrey Sachs and Gerardo de la Paulera for participating today. And thank you, all of you, for participating too. We hope you have enjoyed the first day of the summit. We would like to thank all our speakers panelists, participants for taking part today, and once again, a big thank you to our sponsors. They are PricewaterhouseCoopers, the Asian Development Bank of Latin America, the German Development Institute, Emerging Market Sustainability Dialogues, the Friedrich Ebert Foundation, the Friedrich Naumann Foundation, the German Corporation for International Cooperation, the International Development Research Center, the Inter-American Development Bank, the Institute for the Integration of Latin America and the Caribbean, Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, the Kiel Institute for the World Economy, the Real Instituto Elcano, the United Nations Development Program, the Liberal Network for Latin America, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, the World Bank Group, Accenture, Aerolíneas Argentinas, BBVA Francés, Grupo Peñaflor, Pampa Energía, Puente, Quilmes, and Bodega Vistalva. We would also like to thank our supporting partners, the G20 Argentina 2018. To catch up on all the day's events, make sure you have a quick look at our social media at T20 Solutions on Twitter and Facebook or T20 Argentina on LinkedIn. Tomorrow we will have more sessions and we'll see you all in the morning for an 8.30 start or from 7.30 onwards for breakfast. Have a good evening, and please don't forget tomorrow your badges, and don't forget also to return your headphones today. Thank you very much.